I am so full of gratitude and I truly appreciate this opportunity to do things for you and with you. <clears throat> My husband, who's over there, has been with me on these eight years of campaigning and he told me absolutely do not prepare remarks. He said I'm horrible when I prepare a speech and try to read it. So I have no prepared remarks. That could be good and that could be bad. <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, I wanted to do the thank you to everybody, to everybody who supported me. And as I've talked to you about this role, your, your kind words and your kind support. <clears throat> Second thing is, without, I, I said I was gonna approach this office with really no agenda, but I'll get to that in a minute. There's just a little bit of an agenda. Um, I want to tell you about me, perhaps some more about me than most of you have ever known. Um, I am one of seven children. When I was uh, number five, so we've got, how many have I got sitting here, four? Four and me, that's five of us. Uh, the other two have predeceased us, but, and I'm, I will discuss them a little bit as well. The lovely lady who came up here and helped me hold my Bible is my mother. And I think the greatest, toughest um, thing that I've gotten done in these eight years is to get my mother here <laughs> and to get her on the floor. She said, I'm very proud of you, but you know I don't like those crowds and I don't want to be here. <laughs> but I wanted to show her off because I'm hoping that's how I'll look 23 years from now. But uh, mom, we are very honored to have you. <laughs> Love you, mom. Well, she's not only my, my mother, she is my best friend, and she is a tremendous, tremendous role model. We were seven little stair-step children. From birth to the oldest was only nine and a half years. My mother was in her mid-twenties with those seven children. Um, she is a very, very, very strong person. So I have learned a tremendous amount from my mother, and I do love her as one of my greatest role models ever. ever. My two girls. Jennifer and Maggie, they were the other two up here holding the Bible. They've made tremendous amounts of sacrifice while I've been in the legislature. When I first got here, Maggie was only 15 and was trying to get her driver's license, going through the driving provisions. And I think the week she got her driver's license, I made her page here and I made her drive through Raleigh and, and I make her do a lot of things she didn't want to do. Uh, Jennifer was a senior in high school and she was a cheerleader and there was the prom coming up and was I going to be home and she couldn't believe I wasn't being home with her. Um, so I can get into the whole ultimate punishment but we won't talk about that. Uh, but they're, they're, they, they have both been tremendous women of beauty and grace uh, seeing me through my legislative terms. While I've been here, we've been a little busy. I have, uh, they have both graduated high school. They have both graduated college. Between the two of them, I think I've made 10 moves in various different states, cities, and counties. Um, and, and they are, like I said, truly wonderful people and I hope I've never let them down. Jennifer is a teacher here in the Wake County school system. So trust me, when we're debating education issues and pay, I hear about it. Maggie works out of state. She wanted to sort of get it far away from me. So she's in Tennessee and works at the Knoxville Zoo, hoping to get a job back in North Carolina. She does love her animals. My husband, Edwin Johnson, has been my rock. And I think most of you've met him. Edwin has always been good about following me and making sure I'm doing very well. As I said, I was one of seven children. I was number five. I am not a middle child. I don't have a middle child syndrome. I'm not the oldest. I'm not the youngest. I'm not the most spoiled. I'm just one of seven. Uh, but my mother always made every one of us feel special. My oldest sister, Rebecca, was uh, my confidant and, and pal. And um, I lived with her when I was in law school and going through law school. Uh, and then when I got elected, I said, oh, guess what, Becky? Uh, I gotta have a place to live in Raleigh. Rebecca lives one mile from the legislative building. Seriously opened a room to me, been there, love it. It is such a wonderful place to live. Jennifer has moved in with us. Uh, <laughs> um, my sister, Laura, she's always been my emotional, religious, uh, even financial support early on. Um, she comes down on election day and, and runs a polling booth. She lives in Virginia, but she comes and spends the whole day being there with us. 
Then there's my little baby brother back there. Mark is probably, oh, 280 and six feet tall and big, but he was, uh, he was very small as a baby. And Mark and I are only 11 and a half months apart in age. So every year for 11 days, we are the same age. And I remind him, I'm not that old. Um, but, but I love Mark, and Mark would be there for me to do anything in the world that I needed. And then there's Lisa. Lisa is the baby sister. Um, and Lisa actually works, as we go through some of this controversy, Lisa actually works in the mayor's office in Charlotte. But that's a whole story for a whole nother day. <laughs> Promise we will not get into that one. Promise we will not get into that one. Uh, there are other two, two other very, very special ladies here with me. And again, all, all this family is, is so incredible to me that it's a big part of who I am. I have my two Cathy's. And anybody who's been on my campaign trail said, I would take just one of those Cathy's. They would be great. Kathy Stevens, Mark's wife, is uh, my campaign manager. And she's always been awesome. She's a, a good supporter of me. She just makes me feel so good about myself. So I really don't have to do a lot. I turn it over to her. And then Kathy Chilton knows everybody everywhere. And Kathy is my first cousin and worked in my law office back home, but she's everybody everywhere. Um, my brother committed suicide just short of his 40th birthday. We were all very disheartened, very sad, but I do know a lot about mental illness as a result of that. Uh, that sometimes there's nothing more you can do. He actually, we were trying everything we could, felt like it was headed that path. As a matter of fact, my mom, my dad, and his 12-year-old son were in the house when he did it. But he really felt there was no other way out. So when we talk about suicide awareness, that is something that gets very, very personal to me. I'm telling you some of these experiences because it does bring out who I am. My first term here my sister Barbara. Barbara was the next oldest. Barbara was second in that line. And when I got elected, Barbara had run my law office for 13 years before she was stolen away by a greedy corporate person named my father <laughs> to, to go run a limestone quarry in Fletcher, North Carolina. Uh, but other than that, Barbara had been my heart and soul. Barbara had been there with me all the time. Barbara was second mother to my children. Daycare actually thought one of them was hers and the other was mine, and we just took turns picking them up. Barbara was always there for me. Barbara led many battles for me. Barbara had breast cancer first. Then the rest of us sisters got it, but Barbara led the way on that one. When I got elected, I said, I really I need an L.A., a legislative assistant, and, and I don't know who to get. I don't know exactly what I need, don't completely know who I trust. There's nobody I trust more than Barbara. My sister Barbara commuted from Asheville to be in LA for my first term. We would meet in Winston-Salem, we would drive down together, and, and my dad called us the Golden Girls when we all lived at Rebecca's house. Daddy called us the Golden Girls. Uh, but Barbara was just such an amazing person to help me get through my first term and to be there. Then Barbara said, Sarah, we can really find somebody. We, we're down here. We trust people. We know people. We can find people. And so she went back home. But Barbara was still always there for me and for my children. There was Camp Barbara. There was, you know, they went up there for a week or two at a time. And she, she still loved and, and took care of everyone. And I'm getting somewhere with this story eventually. Um, <clears throat> In 2013, I got a call. We were in, uh, I guess we were in short session, short session, nine. And I got a call from my law office, and it was her husband. And he said, we need you, and it's not good. So that's all I needed to hear. Didn't even know what it was at that point. I got in the car, and I drove to Asheville. And they had put her in the hospital, and she had a metastatic liver tumor. And it was my turn to be there for Barbara. It's my turn to help Barbara. Barbara spent the next six months trying her hardest to live. And she didn't succeed. But she did quite a fight, and she gave me the opportunity to repay a lot of things that she had done. And I thought a lot about that as I went along. So this is the point I'm getting to. I did Barbara's eulogy 
And everybody kept saying, how can you possibly do that as close as y'all were? And I said, but it's the tribute I had to pay to her. Barbara was the second in their child, a second child in their family. Barbara was uh, the second at my law office. She ran the office. She was the second mother to my children. Barbara lived a life of being second. She wasn't looking for the attention or the center or the limelight. All she wanted was for every one of us to feel special, to feel important, to get things done right. That was Barbara. So as I thought about running for Speaker Pro Tem and thought about the position, it's second to the Speaker. But to me, it's also second to you. What I would like for each and every one of you to know is that I want to be here to help you succeed, to help you get where you need to be, whether it's constituent concerns, personal issues, filing your legislation, uh, helping to make you a leader, helping everyone to be everything they need. I can be, well, I've got to be careful because Representative Hall and I have already been round and round about this. Representative Hall's called me his mother. Representative Kyle Hall called me his mother. And I told him, no, I'm not old enough to be his mother, I'll be his sister. But in reality, I'm old enough to be his mother. Uh, I want to be your mother, I want to be your sister, I want to be your friend, I want to be your confidant, I want to be your sounding board. I know that I'm gonna work regularly with leadership to try to make their life easier, to try to make sure that we're a team continuing to work together. But I also wanna be there for you individually. I said the greatest legacy of my office as Speaker Pro Tem would be that nobody outside of here knows what I did, but that and somehow I touched your life, I made it better, I made it easier, I made you succeed in an area that you really wanted to succeed in. So that is my role, my goal as Speaker Pro Tem, to do the things the Speaker asks of me, but to also be there for you. And I appreciate this opportunity and thank you so much.